you about them. Come over here and sit down. Ernest and Alfred pulled up two stools and sat opposite the red-haired man, who seemed a bit drunk. Jolly nice of you, old chap. The Count likes human blood, especially the blood of young women, just like his wife who died mysteriously years ago. What do you mean, mysteriously? She was found dead with tooth marks on her neck. It is believed that they were done by her husband. He killed her then, just as he killed my sister last night. What did you say? Last night? Yes. And she's still up there with the marks on her neck for all the world to see. Count Dracula may be dead, but he can still kill my sister, my beautiful sister. She's dead and I'm certain that he killed her. <laughs> the man began to sob into his drink. Steady on, old chap. Sorry to hear about your sister, but these are quite strong accusations. Have you any proof? Just then, an old man with a country face spoke up from the next table. That man doesn't know what he's saying. He's from another village. The Count was no vampire. He was a good man. He loved the people of the village. I'll never forget the winter of 82. It started to snow in September and didn't stop until April. The people were starving. What did the Count do? He opened up his stores to the people and kept all of us alive. He nearly starved to death himself. The Count is no vampire. Very interesting. So, how do you explain the deaths and the teeth marks? The man stopped for a moment and thought. The vampire bat. Ernest suddenly showed interest. He had learnt the word for vampire bat in Romanian. What's that about a vampire bat? Alfred told him what the old man had said. I think we should go and see this young girl. I say, old fellow, you said your sister was killed by the Count. You wouldn't care to prove it, would you? The drunken young man got to his feet and dragged them to the staircase. They stumbled up, the man talking to himself all the time. We had to bring her here. She was very ill, coughing blood. This was the nearest village with a doctor. Dr. Mogorsky would... They reached the bedroom door. Inside, they could see the body of a young girl laid out on a bed with a sheet covering the lower part of her body. A woman of about 40 was crying beside the bed. On the other side of the bed, an old man in a black suit was gathering up some surgical instruments. The drunken man fell into the room. Look! Look at the work of the vampire count! Alfred and Ernest saw a beautiful pale face. On her neck were two red dots about an inch apart. The old man turned angrily at the intruders. Who are you? Get out of here at once. They're friends of mine, Doctor. They didn't believe that... Well, now you know what a devil the Count was, and still is. You can leave. Well, thank you, Doctor. Uh, I hope we shall have the pleasure again. Alfred wished to get out as quickly as possible. Ernest, on the other hand, was quietly looking around the room. Alfred couldn't keep his eyes off the bloodless girl. I say, Ernest, old chap, I, I, I think I need a drink. At the table in the inn below, Ernest was thinking. I didn't like the doctor at all. Nasty piece of work. Definitely not a gentleman. Did you notice that scratch on his hand? I don't know what you're saying, old boy. As soon as we've had this drink, I suggest we get back to the castle. Chapter 5 The Search Back in Dracula Castle, Alfred and Ernest were sitting in front of a blazing fire after yet another wonderful meal this time of roast goose and apple pie with cream on top. Alfred raised his glass of wine in the air. I would like to drink a toast to the Count and his superb hospitality. 
and his excellent taste in wines. The old fellow certainly knew how to eat and drink well. As for Mania, she is an absolute treasure. You know, Ernest, I'm a little bit worried. The evidence does not seem to be in the old chap's favour, does it? A figure looking like the Count rides out into the moonlit night, and two hours later a girl dies with two teeth marks on her neck. It can hardly be a coincidence now, can it? The question is whether we believe in ghosts or not. As you know, I'd love them to exist, but my logic tells me that they don't. Therefore, that person on the white horse could not have been the Count. So who was it? Well, it certainly wasn't Manya or Gregory. And the only other person in the castle is... Good thinking, old boy. Perhaps that's why he didn't serve us at breakfast yesterday. He was catching up on his sleep. But why? I can't help feeling that the answer must be in the Count's letter. Ah, I've got it here. Let's see. Don't leave a stone unturned. Stone. We have to look under stones. You can lead a horse to water. Suddenly, a scream, just like the one they had heard the previous night was heard faintly echoing through the castle. Alfred shivered. Did you hear it? I certainly did, old boy. And I think it came from outside. They ran out into the castle yard, but there was nothing to be seen except the well. They stood wondering where the sound could have come from. Alfred pointed to the well. Do you see that enormous stone covering the well? How on earth do they get the water out? Interesting question, old boy. And what's that thick piece of wood for? Ernest, come here, quick. Alfred was holding his ear to the stone. What is it? I can hear something like an animal in pain, crying or... No, it's more of a moan. Can you hear it? Sorry, can't hear a thing. I think your mind's playing tricks on you, old boy. It's probably the rumbling of your stomach after that delicious goose. Let's get back inside. It's freezing out here. Gregory was standing inside the door of the dining room with a worried look on his face. Sir Oliver, what is the matter? Oh, probably my imagination. I, I thought I heard someone scream. Oh, that was Don Juan, maybe. He has bad dreams. I beg your pardon? Don Juan? I mean Rodolfo. Don Juan is his nickname. He was loved by many women, but he loved the master more. I see. By the way, Gregory, I've been meaning to ask you. Tell me about Dr. Magorsky. Lord Ernest and I didn't take to him very much. He was the Count's doctor. But he is an evil man. He uses old medicine. The medicine of the witches. Herbs. Leaves. Oh, nothing wrong with herbs. My Aunt Agatha swears by them. Frogs, snakes, bats and mice, and other living creatures. Well, yes, I, I think Aunt Agatha would draw the line there. He bleeds all his patients. He says losing blood is good for you. But he does not care about health. He is a greedy man who loves only money. Thank you very much, Gregory, old fellow. Bleeds his patients. Good night, Sir Oliford. I am an old man and must sleep. Oh, of course, old boy. Sweet dreams. Alfred told Ernest what Gregory said. Ernest was intrigued. It becomes more interesting by the minute. I suggest we go for a walk before breakfast when our minds are clear and try and sort this out. Ernest, old boy, what has got into you? I thought you liked sleep. I wish you'd have pity on me. I'm exhausted. My dear fellow, we're on a case. We can't waste time sleeping. The next morning, Alfred and Ernest got up early and went out into the yard for a walk. Through the thick mist, 
they saw Rodolfo near the well, carrying a tray of food. Alfred was surprised. That's funny. What's Rodolfo doing? I didn't ask for breakfast in bed. Rodolfo had laid the tray on the well top and was holding an enormous piece of wood. Alfred called out. Rodolfo turned with a look of shock on his face. Bright and early, I see, Rodolfo. Or should I say Don Juan? I wanted to ask you about this well top. How do you get the water out? The well is not used. The Count put a stone over it many years ago. I see. Uh, what is that piece of wood for? Rodolfo seemed angry. This well is not used. The wood is rotten. Looks fine to me, but I won't argue with you, old fellow. Now I must leave. Of course. Oh, don't forget your tray. Hmm, those eggs and that bacon look good. Perhaps we should have breakfast now, Ernest. Rodolfo took the tray and went quickly towards the kitchen. Come on, Alfred. Stop thinking of your stomach and let's go for that walk. I suggest we visit the Count. The Count? Yes, I feel he may give us inspiration. Dracula Cemetery was as quiet as an empty house. Even the birds seemed to have stopped singing. Because of the thick mist, they could hardly see more than a few feet in front of them. Suddenly, Alfred couldn't see Ernest anywhere. Ernest? Where on earth have you gone? There was no answer, just the echo of his voice. He called again, and this time got an answer. I'm over here, dear boy, at the Count's grave, and I found something rather interesting. Just keep talking, will you? In that way, I might be able to find you. Finally, Alfred found Ernest leaning over the Count's grave. Don't you think it's rather strange that there is no sign of our footsteps? It's as if the soil was taken out and put back again. Don't forget it rained last night. What I can't understand is why the Count told us in his letter to visit him when he had nothing to tell us. Hold on. I've just had an idea. You don't think that cane of his is hollow, do you? And that inside is a vital message? My word, you're a genius, dear boy. Of course, it must be. Oh, dear. Does that mean we have to do more grave digging? Afraid so, old chap. But you're getting quite good at it. By the way, have you been eating garlic? Garlic? Well, yes, um, I thought it better to be safe than sorry. I, I got dear Manya to let me have a few cloves for emergencies. The smell is enough to keep away the devil himself. As for the vampire bat, he wouldn't dare fly within a mile of us. Come on, let's go and have breakfast. They made their way back by the river to the castle gate which Gregory had left open for them. Alfred was still trying to work out the connection between stones, water, and horses. You know, Ernest, I feel that the solution to our mystery lies very close to that well. There's a big stone there with water under it, and opposite the stable where the Count's horse is kept. I'm sure the answer lies under that stone. Ernest touched Alfred's arm and held a finger to his mouth. Shh! Look! Rodolfo just got out of the well and is pushing the stone back by himself. Good heavens! He must be as strong as an ox! Through the mist, they saw Rodolfo carrying a tray from the well to the kitchen. Alfred slapped the side of his head in annoyance. Dash it! I should have thought of it before. Don Juan was a great lover, wasn't he? What did the Count say in his letter? Beware of the lover. Do you think Rodolfo could be the lover? We'd better keep a very close eye on him and find out what's hidden down that well. Why was he carrying a tray? All this detective work has given me quite an appetite. What about you, Alfred? Oh, yes. And I think we deserve it. 
I feel we're getting very close to an important discovery. Chapter 6 The Missing Link That night, Alfred and Ernest were too tired to go grave digging. They decided, however, that they would keep a careful eye on Rodolfo. They felt that he, and in fact all three servants, were hiding something which might provide the key to the whole Dracula mystery. So next morning, they got up early, before the mist had risen, and slipped out into the castle yard to wait for Rodolfo to appear with his tray of food, as they believed he almost certainly would. About ten feet from the well, Gregory had parked the carriage with the Dracula coat of arms and the head of the vampire bat, painted in gold on the side. They decided that this would be a good place to hide. Ernest looked at his watch. Do you think he's not coming? We've been here for nearly an hour. Perhaps he heard us come out and realized that we're after him. Well, let's give him another 15 minutes. They waited another 15 minutes and were about to give up when they heard the kitchen door slam shut. I think it's him. Sure enough, Rodolfo appeared, carrying the same tray as on the previous day. But instead of stopping at the well, he walked straight to the carriage. Ernest and Alfred began to feel uneasy. However, when he reached the driver's seat, he stopped and laid the tray on it. Then he returned to the well, and using the thick piece of wood as a lever, pushed back the stone. He came back for the tray, and to their surprise, climbed into the well and disappeared. Alfred whistled to himself. I think this is our opportunity. Let's follow him. Alfred reached the well first. He could hear the sound of Rodolfo's boots on the stone steps as he went deeper into the well. At some point, they seemed to just fade away. Alfred looked in, but all he could see was a black hole. I say, I don't fancy getting in there. Looks like the way down to hell. Ernest struck a match and held it over the hole. They could make out spiral steps built on the side of the well. There was nothing to hold on to and the steps looked wet and slippery. So if either of them fell, he would almost certainly go hurtling down to a sure death. Ernest got into the mouth of the well. Be careful, the steps are all wet and slimy. Step by step they climbed down into the darkness, feeling their way as best they could by leaning against the well wall. Suddenly, I Alfred what? saw Ernest fall. For a moment he thought he had seen the last of his friend, and he expected to hear the fatal splash. Instead, he heard Ernest's voice coming from the well. Then he realized what had happened. There was a large hole in the wall, and Ernest had fallen into it, and was now lying on the floor of what, by the looks of it, was a passageway, which led somewhere underground. Are you all right, old chap? Well, just about. I thought I was on my way to meet the Count for a moment. Where the devil are we? Your guess is as good as mine. The home of the vampire bat, I should think. Hold on a tick. I can just make out a dim light at the end there. Ernest got to his feet and felt his way along the passage to a door which was slightly open. Inside they could hear Rodolfo's voice and the grunts of some kind of animal. Ernest pushed the door slightly. There's only one way to find out. Let's go. He opened the door just enough to see what was happening. Rodolfo had his back to them and was facing someone sitting on a chair. He appeared to have a spoon in one hand feeding a baby. The room was warm and comfortable with expensive Persian carpets on the floor. Rodolfo got up to put more wood on the fire, revealing the ugliest creature they had ever seen. 
One side of its face was twisted and shapeless, and its arms and whole body were all bent and moving out of control. Uneaten food and meaningless sounds were coming out of its mouth. Alfred could not help exclaiming, Good heavens! What is that? Rodolfo was speaking to the creature as if it understood what he was saying, but could not reply. Alfred pulled Ernest's arm. I think we ought to go. Rodolfo must have sensed someone was there, because he let out a wild cry and started to run towards them. Ah! You devils! Father said I should trust you because you are English gentlemen, but everybody hates the Dracula name, and you are no different. You want a story for your newspaper. You don't care about the great family, Dracula. Well, I am going to kill you. Rodolfo reached the two men and was about to lift Alfred into the air when Ernest threw his bolas, which was made of thick string, with three metal balls tied to the ends. The bolas went right around Rodolfo's legs. Alfred was thrown into the air and Rodolfo fell forward onto the floor. Ernest threw the end of a piece of rope to Alfred. Here, grab the end of this and tie him up before he recovers. Bravo, Ernest, old fellow. Where on earth did you learn that little trick? Didn't I tell you I spent three months with the rebels in Argentina fighting the dictator? I brought that little fellow back with me. Between the two of them, they managed to tie up the struggling Rodolfo. Ernest was afraid he was going to break the rope, but it soon became clear that it was too strong for him. When they had finally got him under control, Alfred started to speak. Now, Rodolfo, old fellow, I'm frightfully sorry to have to do this, but you simply must understand, we're here to help you. No, you're just like the rest. Look, old fellow, why do you think the Count asked us over here? Now, I think you'd better tell us the whole thing. The creature in the corner let out an animal cry. I suppose it was he who was making the screams in the night. Who is he? I suppose it is a he. Rodolfo said nothing, just boiled with anger. Then he spoke. Well, you know now, and I cannot kill you, so I might as well tell you the whole story. That is the Count's son. The Count's son? Yes. He is 45 years old. He should have died, but... Hold on a tick. 45? But the Countess died 45 years ago. You mean that she died giving birth to that... that gentleman over there? Yes. Radu is the heir to the Dracula estate. He should now be Count Dracula. Radu? That means handsome, doesn't it? Rather ironical. Naturally, the Count did not want the world to know about Radu. It would be a great shame for the family. But he felt great guilt for keeping him here in this... this hole. But Radu doesn't know any better. Well, it looks as if you've let the cat out of the bag, Rodolfo. But don't worry, your secret will be safe with us. I won't even mention it in my article, I promise. Now, one thing puzzles us. Who is this Dr. Magorsky? Dr. Magorsky is an evil man. But the Count was a naive man and trusted him. I think he killed her. Killed the Countess? By bleeding her. This is what he does to make people better. I see. Fascinating. Oh, and one last little question, old boy, now that we've got you in this um, difficult position, so to speak. That was you we saw on the Count's horse the other night, wearing his cloak and hood. 
Rodolfo was silent. Then, hesitatingly, he replied, No. Are you sure you weren't um, sleep-riding, old fellow? Because if it wasn't you, I don't think who it was. Unless it was the Count himself. Now you must trust us. We can work together and sort this whole nasty business out. Our job is to clear the Dracula name, and that's exactly what we will do. All right. I will help you. Oh, what a jolly good fellow. Did you understand that, Ernest? Rodolfo is going to help. I think we can untie him now. Are you sure we can trust him? He could throw both of us into the well with one arm. Well, perhaps uh, you'd better keep your little um, thingy handy, just in case. They first unwound the bolas, and then the ropes from around his arms. He made no attempt to attack them. Alfred sighed with relief. Well, I don't know about you two, but I'm starving. How about breakfast? When Ernest and Alfred were having breakfast, Alfred was still unsure of the situation. There are still a lot of questions unanswered, aren't there, old boy? I mean, who was that chappy on the horse? Now, we don't believe in ghosts. Or do we? I'm not sure we can trust Rodolfo. He may have been lying, or at least not telling us the whole truth. Might he still throw us down the well or something? Oh, no, no, no. Rodolfo's a fine fellow. I think we need to investigate the doctor. All this bleeding, nasty business. Well, in that case, I suggest that after breakfast, we get old Gregory to pop us into the village so that we can get to the bottom of this Magorsky fellow. Ah, Rodolfo. A superb breakfast, as usual. I hope you didn't just accidentally drop a few spoonfuls of cyanide into the coffee. Rodolfo did not reply or smile. Funny about foreigners, they can't take a joke. Chapter 7 Dr. Benjamin Magorsky They decided to go straight to the doctor's house and face him. For some reason, Rodolfo insisted on driving them there. After a two-hour journey, they arrived at an iron gate, leading into a large estate surrounded by a tall, glass-topped wall. A well-kept drive led up to the doctor's house. On looking out of the window of the carriage, Ernest was surprised to see a large house with at least 20 rooms. Take a look at that old boy. He's not doing too badly for a country doctor. A house like that must be worth a fortune. The door was opened by a servant. After a long wait, the doctor, who was still an extremely handsome man, with long silver hair brushed back on both sides of his head, came into the room. Surprisingly, he spoke excellent English. I believe we've met before, gentlemen. Under less happy circumstances. You are English, I believe? Yes, Doctor. We're doing a spot of investigating for the late Count. They tell me you've been asking questions that have been upsetting some of the villagers. Not at all, Doctor. People have been very happy to tell us all they know. It seems that these rumours about the Count having a taste for human blood are totally unfounded. I don't know who you've been talking to, gentlemen. But I can assure you that the Count was and I believe still is, a vampire. You forget, gentlemen, I was his doctor. You say, still is? Do you mean to say that you don't believe that the Count is dead? Or do you believe in ghosts? I believe he died, yes. But I also believe in his power to come back from the dead. In fact, I believe that vampires are humans who have died and come back to Earth. Very interesting, Doctor. But you say the Count was also a vampire in real life. 
Yes. The Count had very rare powers. I once examined his teeth at some length and... At that moment, a shout was heard from the hall, and all seven feet of Rodolfo came through the door into the sitting room. That man is a liar. He is the vampire, not the Count. Tell them how you... The doctor looked at Rodolfo with an ironic smile on his face. You can't prove it. The Count never recognized you as his son. Maybe not publicly, but I am going to prove how you blackmailed the Count so you would keep his secret. You were the only person who knew about Radu. Rubbish. Nonsense. I can get all the villagers to say how you forced large sums of money out of them and threatened to kill them if they did not pay. The doctor began to laugh hysterically. <laughs> this man is mad, absolutely mad. He needs to be locked up. And if he doesn't shut up soon, I shall call my men and have him taken away. During this confrontation, Ernest and Alfred just sat and watched, not knowing who was telling the truth. Suddenly, Rodolfo came towards the doctor and took him by the shirt collar. He probably would have broken his neck if Alfred had not stopped him. Gentlemen, there's no need to fight like animals. We're all civilized here. Civilized? This doctor is an animal. He has killed thousands by bleeding them to death. Lies. Prove it, you monster. Suddenly, Rodolfo calmed down. Yes, Dr. Lover, I will prove it. You can prove nothing. Yes, I can. Before the Count died, he left me his diary, in which he wrote everything. When you killed the Countess with your so-called medicines and your bleeding, not one day went by that the Count did not write down everything. How you blackmailed him. How you got rich by threatening the poor and sick. How you used the vampire bat to do your dirty work for you. How everybody hates you and fears you. <laughs> no one would believe it. They all think the Count was the vampire. It's his word against mine. You know very well that if it's a question of your word against his... The people will believe his. The people loved the Count and never really believed the rumors. Suddenly a fearful screeching was heard from the next room. Everybody except the doctor froze. It's nothing, gentlemen. It's my falcon. He wishes to go hunting. As soon as Ernest heard the screech, he showed great excitement. Alfred, old chap, this is the moment I've been waiting for. Ernest walked excitedly to the door and was about to open it when the doctor shouted at him. Don't open that door unless you want to die, Lord Ernest. I have specially trained them to go straight for the neck. Doctor, you don't think I would come all the way from England and not see the vampire bat in the light of day? After all, I am a specialist. I warned you. No sooner had Ernest opened the door than a loud flapping of wings and the screeching of a starving bat was heard, and an ugly creature with pointed wings and a squashed nose with black hair sticking out of it flew wildly at Ernest. Ah! Alfred screamed and ran to fight off the vicious creature, but by the time he had reached his friend, the bat had already got its teeth in his neck. To Alfred's surprise, Ernest just stood there while the creature got its fill from his neck. Alfred did not know what to do. Soon the bat drew out.